determined firing of our first peacetime atomic test. Large-scale and vital weather operations were no novelty to Colonel Holzman. One thing he already knew, complete weather data and its on-the-spot analysis for a long period preceding the enemy we talk test was a prime requisite for Operation Sandstone. Consequently, many months before the scheduled date of the first test, the advance echelon of Joint Task Force 7 was assembled at a West Coast port. Among the troops who boarded transport were meteorological personnel from the Air Force and the Navy, together with top forecasters from the United States Weather Bureau. This group comprised highly trained technicians who were fully aware of the precise nature and importance of their assignment. Wherever possible, the men in the group had been selected because of their experience with tropical weather operations in the Pacific. <laughs> Arrival at any week talk marked the beginning of continuous weather observations, which were to be maintained for the next five months. Construction units early on the scene were aware of weather, while they were engaged in the work of preparing the test site, the construction men and engineers were blistered by a merciless sun, lashed by a ceaseless wind, and stung by flying sand. Dust was an ever-present source of irritation. Sometimes clouds intervened between the workers and the sun. To the construction men, clouds meant only momentary relief from the heat. But to the urologists, the wind and sea, the sun, the rain, and the clouds were a challenge. Each was a separate element whose movements and moods must be fitted into a picture which would foretell future weather. There was very little weather history available to the meteorologists. Meager Japanese records were in existence, and data gathered during the previously held operations crossroads, together with records kept by the military air transport commands which operated over the Pacific area. Using these sources, Meteorologists compiled a digest of weather information for the Eniwetok area. The urologists knew that their store of information was limited. They knew that more data must be obtained about the air masses covering thousands of miles of ocean. Thousands of miles, yes, but a vast distance which could be shrunk by the employment of a machine of war, the long-range reconnaissance aircraft. Quick to employ every means by which information could be obtained, the urologists promptly called upon weather observation squadrons based in the United States and at Guam to aid in the gathering of data. A hurricane reconnaissance squadron moved into the test area to aid in weather study. These huge planes spanned leagues of the Pacific in ever-widening and ceaseless probing of the movements of the upper air. Equipped as veritable flying laboratories, the B-29 aircraft radioed regular weather reports back to their base. If, however, any unusual or sudden weather phenomena were encountered, the airmen immediately alerted base aerologists. Through use of weather plane crews, much information was obtained which might otherwise have been learned too late. Supplementing the aircraft reconnaissance, were observation stations located on remote islands in a far-flung network. Typical of these islands was Majuro, several hundred miles south of the test site. 
here a small detachment of weather specialists was stationed for several months before and during the tests at any week off. Their daily existence was peaceful and unhurried, their manner of living regimented only by the schedule of aerological observations and recordings. Despite the remoteness of their station from beaten paths, the men were not deprived of the pleasures of civilization. Mail from home and ice cream were delivered frequently by plane. Mail call, greatest of morale boosters, was an ever-pleasant break in routine. Hot in Joplin, Sergeant? She should be here. Despite the idyllic tropical surroundings, the weathermen never lost sight of their mission, procurement and evaluation of weather data. No means was overlooked for implementing the gathering of complete information. Balloons carried radio transmitters aloft, which were used to send back to Earth level-by-level -level reports of temperature, humidity, and atmospheric pressures. Radar devices were used to follow the balloon in its ascent. Through this method, the direction and velocity of upper air movements could be traced with minute accuracy. Reports were consolidated at the outlying stations and then radioed on regular schedule to the Weather Central Aerological Nerve Center aboard the Task Force flagship in any we talk lagoon. Here were housed the meteorological chief and his assistants. Here was evaluated the mass of data received from the widespread weather network. In this busy center were compiled the findings which would decide whether or not the tests were to go off on schedule. Into this one point funneled all the reports from which the urologists would determine the weather probabilities for the elected detonation date, the likelihood of danger to personnel from radioactive residue after the blast. Observation procedure used aboard ship was identical with that followed by the shore station. from United States Weather Bureau stations at Guam, Hawaii, and Wake, from Joint Task Force Aerological Observation Points on Rondurik, Marjolaine, Majuro, and any we talk, from distant weather reconnaissance planes, from ships in the lagoon, there poured a steady flow of observation reports. Summation of all the information received at the Weather Central was presented to top officers of the task force at frequent meetings. At a similar meeting, the findings of the meteorologists will be weighed by the task force commander in making his decision as to the actual detonation time and date. Complete weather maps of distant areas were used by the urologists in Weather Central. These maps were received at regular intervals via facsimile recorders, which translated radio signals into a visual map. Day after day, week after week, the tireless weather planes searched far from their bases, tracking the movement of the upper air, recording and reporting temperature, pressure, humidity, and wind. assigned route, the B-29s were out on flights averaging 10 hours duration. Humdrum patrols, which covered hundreds of thousands of square miles of ocean area, not reached by the shore station. Patiently and steadily, weather personnel made and recorded observations, formulating a picture of the average weather for the area. besides serving as a unit in the overall weather network, maintained its own observers on islands of the atoll. By this means, the forecasting of local rain squalls was made possible. This knowledge was of paramount importance, as rain drenching the test site at the moment of detonation might invalidate certain scientific experiments.
Once again, the top commanders meet to study the weather forecasts at hand. But this session is really important. This is the one at which the commander will decide yes or no for the first test. And it's yes. Because the radioactive cloud, byproduct of an atomic explosion, may be a terrible and deadly menace. Its probable course must be accurately plotted in advance. Minute bits of debris, dust, and fissionable material, all tremendously radioactive, are contained within the cloud. Separation of these particles from the cloud by gravity or precipitation is called fallout. The area on which such products may fall can become seriously contaminated. With the course of the cloud plotted by radiological safety personnel, aircraft crews are briefed as to the correct altitudes at which they must fly, are shown the areas to be avoided in their flights after the blast. Since the bomb is to be fired as scheduled, evacuation of personnel from the islands and the lagoon begins. Inasmuch as the watchword of the task force is safety, every person in the proving ground must be removed to a safe place before the blast is set off. These men will depart from the islands and remain aboard transports offshore until radiological safety parties have declared the land to be safe for reoccupation. Both military and civilian chiefs of the test make final inspections of the blast site. Scientists carry out last-minute checks on instruments. Cables having been checked are covered. Simple pressure gauges have long been ready for the test. Preparation of installations has been completed. The site is ready for the detonation. With personnel aboard, the task force departs for a point safely distant from the zero site. Sunset brings cessation of work to certain of the troops, but not security watches alert for intruders. Nor is there any rest for the weather crews. As the detonation moment nears, the urgency of their work increases.
since the first test, days which saw no rest for the weather probers, hours in which commanders of the task force were constantly in touch with the meteorological situation. And the ever-changing weather picture was kept up to date through the medium of radio, enabling observers to collect data from remote stations. Air crewmen were constantly on the alert to check weather conditions. But weather aircraft alone were not enough. Ground stations also carried on hourly observations of the changing cloud structures, shifting winds. So it was through a pooling of the knowledge gathered by all these sources that Weather Central was able to predict the aerological conditions with great precision. Even aboard the command ship of the task force, observations were taken. Here in the hub of the weather network, men were on a 24-hour alert were steadily, quietly, and efficiently creating a dependable preview of wind and rain and clouds. And it was on the weather central that all eyes were focused. Would the second test be held on schedule? Will the top commander say the word that will loose another atomic explosion at the planned moment? While thousands of men waited to learn the decision, staff members were studying the weather forecast and hearing the latest information presented by one of the senior weather officers. The cloud conditions are suitable, but the upper winds are bad. To shoot under these circumstances would present a terrible hazard to the task force personnel. The decision? Postpone the test for at least 24 hours. Men were ready for the test. The island was prepared, waiting. Of all the components needed to make the test a success, only weather failed to meet the deadline. But while weather was not good for the test, its not being propitious had been forecast by the urologist. With one postponement already on the book, the staff was doubly interested in the weather picture, anxiously studied every available bit of information. Weather personnel unhurriedly and carefully continued the schedule of observations which had been established early in the project. All task groups have reported readiness, and General Hall has decided to uh, carry out the mission according to schedule. Okay. Uh, now we're going to have to have two more meetings. We will have one at 023 and one at 0445. This will give us an opportunity to change our recommendation in case of the shift in the wind. With receipt of the go-ahead order from the task force commander, electronically controlled drone planes took off from any we talk and embarked on their mission of penetrating the radioactive cloud which would follow the blast. information was put together, evaluated, plotted. This time, the urologist forecast that tomorrow's weather will be satisfactory for conducting the test. Yoke blast will be loosed only one day late. At the sound of the gong, it will be minus 10 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. cameramen are illuminated by the blast. Again, the clouds followed the pattern and course predicted by the urologist. 
zebra blast, third and final test of Operation Sandstone, was held on schedule. Thus was concluded a project, the accomplishing of which was made possible only through the very closest cooperation of the armed forces and civilian agencies. Operation Sandstone was a success because trained personnel could and did work as an integrated team.